Um, there's no doubt at all. We uh, we had a, a basically a national COVID service uh, for quite a long time uh, during this pandemic. So the National Health Service, uh, but basically, you know, NHS pretty much shut down uh, GPs and A and E and everything much everything else uh, to anyone who didn't have COVID. People making decisions themselves not to come forward. Uh, GPs not making appointments available. Uh, basically, an awful lot of their uh, the appointments that people had uh, and checkups and things simply not available. The the chickens are coming home to reason now we're seeing excess deaths uh, in the home non-covid related we're also seeing those backlog of cases six million people on those waiting lists right now Sajid Javid when he came in as health secretary talked about it going up to something like 13 million people in a population of 67 million those are extraordinary numbers aren't they yeah I think Julia I think the, the numbers are actually mind-blowing if you look from about April 2020 to November 21 that's 18 months 29 million fewer outpatient attendances 4 million fewer at elective vet procedures and that translates as you said into 6 million in waiting lists that's one in 10 of us but actually 300,000 are waiting more than a year that's a 100-fold increase and actually, I was looking at data yesterday. I couldn't quite believe this in each testing. 18,000 people are apparently waiting more than two years. And in today's Telegraph, Carol Secure is telling us 50,000 missing cancer patients. 24,000 need significant treatment right now because it's been delayed. Now, I want to put this figure to you. The increase in spending is $36 billion for the NHS, which is $1 billion less than the NHS Test and Trace program. How come we have a national insurance rise for the most important significant thing we need to do right now but with the test and trace you can just pull it out the back pocket and get on with it there's something fundamentally wrong now and all of those people the pundits out there need to switch focus and start addressing these delays because we have some of the worst outcomes particularly yeah. for cancer in Europe. Well, we had and we had some of those worst outcomes compared with our, you know, certainly Western European nations and indeed many Eastern European nations yeah. as well, long before COVID. And that was uh, not down to that. Oh, our staff are all useless, or we haven't got the right machines. It was simply down to the fact that the length of time it, it takes to get a GP appointment, the GP refer you uh, and wait for that appointment, get onto the consultant, meet the consultant, and then get on the waiting list, and then wait for a diagnostic test, and then see the consultant again. And frankly, unless you've got the sort of uh, well, either sharp elbowed uh, middle class uh, uh, in contacts that people like me have, or you can afford private healthcare, basically, you're whether or not you're going to be dealing with you know stage four or. Stage stage one cancer it is down to you know you know how quickly you get seen and we know that the outcomes in this country are lower because of those delays so we've already got that problem and we've exacerbated it even worse yeah so you make a very important point the 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 point at which you pick up the cancer has a huge impact on survival. Stage one cancer survivals can be like 90%, whereas by the time you get to what's called stage four, that means it's around your body. You've got metastases. It can be in your lungs. It can be in your brain. It can drop to as low as 10% in many of these diseases. So what we need to do is have a service with cancer. Once you're symptomatic and you think you're being referred for cancer, we should have same day diagnostics. We should have targets, which mean you're going to be treated and within 48 72 hours and we need to invest to do that are, are so other we're... countries doing that i mean that may well be yeah. what's happening privately and again you can go and see an nhs consultant or get to see them after you know two or three months and then they say well i'm not going to be able to treat you until x um but if you come and see me in my private harley street clinic i can do you on wednesday Yes, definitely. And what happened at the moment about only about 85 percent of people are seeing within the two week target. So that means one in six people is waiting more than two weeks. And every day matters with what we call stage shift, because you could be in stage one, two by the time you get seen and then you get to the operation. You could have transgressed and you get a much worse outcome. What we need is this direct access system. But also what we need is a plan to deal with this winter surge so it doesn't get in the way. This summer, we were starting to make improvements and now we've gone back again. And if we don't fix what happens in winter, we end up in this bind all the time. And that's where the six million, yeah. as you're adding more people, could keep going up. Yeah, exactly. And we, again, we just keep going through this again and again and again, and it's only going to get worse. But of course, we don't have every single day the TV news, the radio news, all the newspapers publishing 
the latest COVID deaths or the latest move from people from, you know, stage one to stage two, stage three or stage four cancer. We don't see the deaths from heart disease. We're only still focusing on COVID deaths. And we know now that an awful lot of those COVID deaths, they are happening to people who are not ill with COVID. They simply have tested positive for COVID as an awful lot of the population has in, in recent uh, in recent weeks and months. Um, and our, our figures still look you know really high and we still have people and in the media who should know better saying, oh, you know, 300 people or whatever have died on this day. Um, isn't this terrible? We've got a massive crisis. But actually, those figures are, are just, I mean, they're, they're, virtually un, they're virtually meaningless now, aren't they? Well, I think what's happening here is for the first time in two years, people are starting to question the data. Even the BBC was coming on board oh, saying half the population were actually in hospital were not actually COVID. In fact, what is a case of COVID? It should be a combination of cough, fever and viral pneumonia. The number of people with that is very small. What it's also done is dis distract us again. We we've got Nightingale Surge hospitals being built. Apparently, they won't even be ready for a two or three weeks time. And actually, again, they're a waste of time and a waste of resources. There are too many people in the game of advising the government who don't understand healthcare. One figure for £250 million, you could sort out radiotherapy services for cancer. That's half the cost of the Nightingale hospitals, for which nobody even questioned them, and they went completely unused. So there needs to be a complete shift of focus away from COVID to start asking questions about the serious diseases like cancer, which are real killers right now, and tens of thousands of people are on that waiting list. And can you just imagine the anxiety it causes you when you get that letter to say, I'm sorry, your operation is cancelled, and you're yeah. waiting for a life-saving operation? completely unacceptable. And these people, and not in any way to say that people in their 80s and 90s lives don't matter at all. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that at all. But nevertheless, a lot of the people we're talking about with the cancer, we're talking about much younger people, often with you know school age or younger children uh, with all of their lives ahead of them um, who, who could be saved and who are not being saved because we're not focusing on that. I do want to ask you just finally about the Partygate affair. Um, you know, you're, you're, you'll be watching and reading the news the same as everybody else. Latest uh, accusations uh, and claims and, and not, not all denied about uh, Boris Johnson's birthday party for 30 people on the 19th of June 2020. Mm -hmm. um, the issue I'd like to ask you about, though, is not, you know, what do you think about that? It's just that there were rules in place at the time of banning, you know, people gathering indoors, <coughs> even work meetings that were not entirely 100% necessary for the purpose of work, uh, only limited meetings allowed outdoors, people were being fined and things like that. We, we were told those, those rules were there in place at that time to save lives. But clearly the Prime Minister and his team didn't think there was any risk to them. What do you, as a professor of evidence-based medicine, what do you infer from that? Well, I think there are there are quite a few issues here. Number one is, whatever you felt about the rules, and, and yourself and I looked at many of the rules and thought, well, these are completely ridiculous, you still would follow them because they're of legal laws and have implications for how the whole of society behaves. And that's what many people did. The problem is when you perceive your risk is not as high as you consider, then basically you will start to break the rules down. Yeah. And that's what was happening here. The people making the policies were looking very difficult to what was required compared to what they were setting for everybody individ individually. They must have perceived their risk was very low. The problem is, with that comes a sort of moral outrage that people look at it and go, well, if you're the people at the top and you didn't even believe in the rules, why were we following them? And there are many situations I'm talking to which people are looking back, and I've said this before, they were not at the death of their parents. They were not at the birth of their child. And I'm sorry, that just is unacceptable in a democracy and legally needs changing. So you cannot stop somebody whose parent is dying going into their when they're in hospital. And that has happened. So I, it makes sense to me why people are incredibly angry. But I also consider you have a duty, whatever position you are, particularly when you're in the public eye, to act responsibly at all levels, irrespective of what you consider the rules are and whether they're right or not. And that's one of the issues here. And it's now getting to the point where the number of parties is becoming actually out of control like many of the policies. Professor Carl Hennigan, always good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed, 7.34.